Hello and welcome back everyone. In this video we are going to look at the structure of a SAM project and a .NET Lambda function, the files that get created when you initialize a SAM project and the different configuration options that you have in your SAM template. Let's get into it. So here we are in our ID again, and this is the same project structure that we initialized in the first video in this series. If you missed that video, then there's a link in the description to go and find out and watch that. Now, what I wanted to cover in this video, as I said in the intro, is the different components of a SAM project, how to define a Lambda function in .NET, and also a little bit about testing. So if I start with the template file itself, where we actually define the Lambda function that we want to deploy. And in the first video, we talked about this code URI path, and that's how the SAM CLI knows where to look to build and compile your project. The second important thing in this file is this handler section, and this is where you tell the Lambda service exactly what library class and method to invoke when it passes an event to your Lambda function. And this is made up of the name of the library that you've, that you've built, the namespace, the class, and the method name. So if we go and actually look at our function code now, is we know that our library is called hello world. We have the namespace of hello world, the class is called function, and then the method that we want to invoke is called function handler. When it comes to actually defining a function in Lambda, then you, you, you specify a method, and when the Lambda service invokes your method, it passes an event into that into that method. As we know, Lambda is an event-driven way of running compute. And behind the scenes, that event data is just passed in as a string, but because we're working with an object-oriented language that allows strongly typed objects, we can actually deserialize that string into a actual object. In this case, we're integrating with API Gateway. We're building an API. So we have this API Gateway proxy request class. And that class actually comes from the amazon.lambda.api gateway events um, NuGet package. And there, these are, there's a set of packages across almost all AWS services that have these pre-built strongly typed objects that you can use. And another really cool thing is with this Lambda serializer. This is where we tell Lambda what to use to do the deserialization. And the Lambda service will do that on our behalf. We don't need to worry about deserializing that event data into an actual object. And in this case, by default, it will use the system text JSON um, deserializer. You could update that to use, say, Newtonsoft, or you could write your own custom deserialization logic. When we actually finish processing our, our uh, request, we then, because we're integrating with API Gateway, we need to return something. In this case, we return an API Gateway response and we send some, some HTTP details, the body, the status code, and some headers. So now let's have a look in a bit more detail about the template file. So we've already talked about the code URI and the handler. Um, the runtime is, is quite clearly .NET 6. Um, so this architecture section is a really interesting one because as a default, Sam will give us an x86 64-bit processor. And up until September 2021, this was the only option for Lambda. But as of September now, last year, we can now change that to use an ARM-based processor and specifically the Amazon Graviton 2 processor. And that's estimated to give a 19% better performance for a 20% lower cost. And because .NET Core is a cross-platform language, we can switch that to ARM64 almost instantly and get all them additional performance and cost benefits with little to no change to our code. We can specify how much memory we want our function to have, any environment variables, and also we can then specify our, our events that are going to invoke our Lambda function. One of the really cool things about SAM is that if I specify an API event on any of my functions, SAM will automatically create me an API. So you're seeing here, I've got no, no specification for creating an API in my, in my template. SAM will do that on my behalf because it knows that I've got an event for an API of type API. Now I can override that and actually build my own API if I need to add any custom, um, custom configuration, but SAM can do a lot of that out of the box. 
one thing I don't want to call out is this global section up at the top here. And this is where you can say across all of all of say global variables. So you can set the same configuration across all of your functions. So commonly things like your runtime and your architecture, they may go up there. You may have some environment variables that you want to set across all of your functions. Uh, there's a whole bunch of um, different um, configuration options that you have for your Lambda function. Um, I will put a link to this, this AWS document in the description. So a few different, different bits I want to call out in here. <clears throat> I won't go through all of these in great detail, but some of the really useful ones I find myself using a lot are the uh, VPC configuration. So if you need to interact with maybe an RDS database in a private subnet, you need to configure how your Lambda connects to a VPC, and we'll cover that in a later video. We can turn on X-ray tracing. Um, we can specify a role if we need to. Um, and one of the ones I actually use the most is this policies section. And this is where you can actually define the, the IAM policies for your Lambda function. Now, one of my favorite parts of using SAM to build serverless applications is around the pre-built policy templates that come with SAM. So if I click over to this other tab now, rather than us needing to know how to, the different IAM permissions to maybe write to a DynamoDB table, SAM comes with some pre-built policies that you can just set and then it will create the relevant permissions. So if I go to my policy template list here, for example, and let's say I want to write to a DynamoDB table, so when I want to add these IAM permissions to my Lambda function, instead of needing to remember all of these different actions that I need to configure, I can simply add a policies section to my Lambda function definition. I want a DynamoDB write policy. And when I define that policy, all I need to provide is a parameter called table name. So I can say table name, and let's say my DynamoDB table is called my DynamoDB table. And what Sam will do now, at the point when I build my Sam template, it will take that predefined policy and actually translate that into the actions and resources that you see here. So it's a really cool feature that saves you needing to remember exactly how to define, write, read, or different permissions across AWS serverless resources. So that is everything I have today. Um, in the next video, we are going to look at how you can use dependency injection within AWS Lambda. Thank you again for watching. Please hit subscribe if you found this video useful. Thank you.